Eight minutes past 12. Last week on the show, while Esther Ranson was standing in, we looked at the subject of ME, because people diagnosed with the condition are no longer able to give blood. Now, we've had a huge response from people with experience of the condition, and because this is such a controversial area, we thought it might be a good idea to get some experts onto the show to deal with some of the points that have been raised. Dr Charles Shepherd is medical advisor to the ME Association, and Professor Leslie Findlay is clinical director Director of the National ME Centre and the Centre for Fatigue Syndromes. I spoke to them both earlier and I asked Charles Shepherd just what is ME and are we any closer to knowing what causes it? Well, ME stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis and in very simple terms it's an illness which often starts with a viral infection and people then have a range of symptoms, primarily muscle symptoms, muscle fatigue, and also brain symptoms, probably problems with memory, concentration, balance, just generally feeling unwell. And these systems, uh, I mean, these symptoms persist for a long period of time in many of these patients. It is a very disabling and has been recognised as a neurological illness. Yes. I mean, Professor Findlay, to be absolutely clear, nowadays there's no longer any suggestion that it's a psychological condition, is there? Um, no, there's no suggestion it's a psychological condition, but psychological factors can adversely influence the, the symptoms um, and they have to be taken into account when one's planning a total management strategy for an individual patient. Would you agree with that, Dr. Shepard, that nowadays we don't look upon it as a psychological condition? Uh, well, I, I thoroughly agree. You know, the Department of Health, the World Health Organization, uh, you know, classifies this as a neurological illness. And, you know, like with many chronic disabling illnesses, psychological factors, social factors can sometimes play a role. That's not disputed. But it is essentially a neurological illness with other factors involved. <clears throat> now, you see, since Esther was talking about this last week, we've had an email, for instance, which which says that um, all the research and treatment funding then has inappropriately gone to the psychiatric profession since the 1980s. What do you say to that, both of you? Well, to a certain extent, well, that, that is true. Uh, certainly in the UK, the vast amount of government-funded research has gone into behavioural and psychological therapies, and there's been a great deal of criticism about that. Fortunately, what we now have is the Medical Research Council setting up an expert group, which I'm a member of, to look into research in this illness. And we have been, for the past two years, looking at what needs to be done in the way of biomedical research. And a list of priorities in biomedical research has now been sent to the board at the MRC. They are looking at these priorities, and we are expecting an announcement very shortly on this. Professor Findlay, I mean, is it true, then, that we've been wasting money, um, directing the money towards the psychiatric profession? <sighs> Waste is a very is, is a very strong word to use. Um, the money, I'm, I'm a, I agree with Charles, could have been used perhaps more wisely. But um, th this is a complex illness, and it represents. And the MRC would state this that it represents a group of disorders. It is not a single entity, and we're still having great trouble defining within this large group of patients, the individual types of chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, that exist. And one, if one takes a group of patients, the symptom complex that the individuals complain of, honestly. And, and, and uh, yet... the, the NICE guidelines recon recognize complex and severe uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, to emphasize the, the complexity of this this, this, this illness, it is not a simple entity. It's not like some tuberculosis where you have a defined marker and a defined organism and a defined treatment. So, and Dr. Shepard, you, you would agree that this is a range of different conditions? Yes, I mean, this is another key point, that, that we have renamed and redefined this illness from ME into what's now called chronic fatigue syndrome, the term that they medical profession tends to use and unfortunately this has now produced a, 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 it's rather like I, dumping everyone with different types of arthritis inflammatory arthritis osteoarthritis um, infective arthritis under the under one umbrella and saying they've all got the same cause the same symptoms and the same treatments and that does not apply to arthritis it does not apply to everyone who comes 
under this umbrella of chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome. And, yet, and this you... is one of the key points that the MRC is addressing, the need for subgrouping people under this umbrella, finding the different causative factors that are going on, and then applying appropriate diff- forms of management to the different types of subgroups under this umbrella. Yeah, I mean, you look at the situation, for instance, here in Berkshire, where our primary care trusts are offering cognitive behavioural therapy. Is that appropriate any longer? It's not appropriate as a one-size-fits-all treatment, and this is our big problem with the NICE guideline, and it's why patients object to the NICE guideline, because the NICE guideline recommends that CBT and graded exercise therapy should be offered to everyone with mild to moderate ME, and this is not what we feel is an appropriate one-size-fits-all treatment. Many patients find these therapies either ineffective, around about 50% with CBT, and in the case of graded exercise treatment if you apply this wrongly you make these patients worse so that is why there is you know terrific concern and anger amongst the patient community with the nice guideline can can i move on to um the uh, this business of the lightning therapy the lightning process um because it was very controversial when esther was talking about it last week her daughter went through it but some listeners listeners were angry that we even mentioned the lightning process why is it so controversial professor findley first um, that's a very, very straightforward question and a very complex answer. Um, I think the lightning process has a part to play in the management of some patients. It is not a specific treatment for chronic fatigue syndrome, ME. It's used to treat a whole raft of conditions. But there are some patients that can be recognised who have factors which would lend themselves, factors which are perpetuating the illness, which would lend themselves to the lightening process. Now, these are, in my opinion, a very small group of patients overall. But because lightening process practitioners are often only experienced in that one technique, they apply it to anybody who visits them with an objective of getting treatment. So they're patients are treated in an unselected manner and therefore this has led to all sorts of uh, complications and dissatisfaction. Dr Shepherd? Well I, I have strong objections to the lightning process in particular the way it's marketed to very vulnerable groups of people Agreed. with adverts which are making unsubstantiated claims about Agreed. success rates. But it clearly is true for some and, I and, do, and as uh, you both seem to be agreeing that this is multifactorial very complex, no one patient is exactly the same as the other Well I think uh, I absolutely agree with this but um, the and I agree with Charles' comments on the lightning process, it's been badly badly applied, poorly researched uh, and we would use it or recommend it probably in perhaps 1 in 30 or 1 in 40 of patients after they've been properly assessed over a long period of time and more standard management programs have been applied. Before we run out of time, can I finally ask both of you really, because a lot of people who contacted us (coughs) uh, were asking about recovery rates from ME. What can you tell us about the numbers and are indeed there any robust figures on this? Dr Shepard first. Well, I wouldn't say there were really robust figures. I I think it's it's, a lot of it is is clinical judgment from individuals, you know, that see patients with this and and a limited amount of epidemiological research. Um, Where I come in is, I, I think we probably have three groups. We have a group at one end of the spectrum who are severely affected, certainly at some stage in their illness, and they probably account for about 25% of the total. I mean, these are people who are bed-bound, wheelchair-bound, house-bound. We have a large group in the middle who make some degree, and I think the word here is improvement over the course of time, but do not recover. Um, But, you know, they hit a glass ceiling 50, 60%, 70% of what they were normally like. And then we have a small group at the other end of the spectrum who make a much more significant degree of improvement or may even finally recover. I mean, an example there is Yvette Cooper, a former government minister. I would add that the uh, improvement prognosis uh, in children and adolescents with this disease does seem to be a lot better than it is in adults. Mm. And Professor Findlay? Oh, I would... Uh, I, wait, there aren't robust figures, and I think, uh, I think Charles is right. We would normally say that the average duration, taking across the group, the average duration of this type of illness is three to five years, with at least 40% of patients. 
very important subject, isn't it? It's very important that we hear a balanced argument on it. So we put some of those issues to the founder of the Lightning Process, Phil Parker. Phil's website calls the process a non-medical tool that is tailored to help people who are stuck in their life or health. Well, BBC Radio Berkshire's Duncan McClarty first asked him whether he agreed that the process is only appropriate in a small fraction of ME cases. You know, that sounds like scientific data, but it's not science. There's no evidence to say that. That's just their opinion. First thing we do is we have a chat with people and we assess them as to whether we think this would be a useful thing for them because obviously we want to see people who we think are going to get value from this. If you're not an ME specialist, how would you know if it's appropriate? Uh, well, we are specialists at the lightning process. Uh, that's We know more about the lightning process than these people because we designed it and trained in it. So what we're looking for is do we think these people are likely to get benefit from the stuff that we do. What we're really interested in is how can we help these people who, who've got stuck uh, where there aren't many solutions? Is there anything we can do to help them? That's really where we're coming from. Well, can I just say thank you very much for all your emails on the subject of ME over the last week or so. I think we've certainly shown that it's a complex area with plenty of strong and sometimes conflicting views. We also asked Phil Parker whether he agreed that the process was aggressively marketed, as those two experts told me. But basically, our practitioners um, don't make claims. What they say is that, you know, our experience is that when some people use this, they can make changes. That doesn't guarantee change. If you, you know, you have you have a, a business, then you you want to tell people about it, but it doesn't make it a great marketing. And that's the thing I would deny, deny and say that that's all we're doing. Saying, look, this is something that we found is very useful, and uh, have a look at it. If you want to talk to more, talk to us more about it, then do. If you don't, that's fine as well. We don't, we really don't market it aggressively at all. Well, there you are. You see, that was um, Phil Parker, who is the founder of the Lightning Process. And earlier on, I was talking to Dr. Charles Shepard, medical advisor to the ME Association, and Professor Leslie Findlay, who's clinical director of the National ME Centre and the Centre for Fatigue Syndromes. Now let's move on.